Birds can make a remarkable variety of different calls. From the unison call of the Siberian crane, strengthening the pair's bond, to the nearly infinite noises parrots can make. But the most well-known bird calls are the songs of passerines. Calls and songs can have many different meanings, though most are either used for territorial or reproductive reasons. How do these birds develop these sometimes complex songs, or even make some of the really weird, almost alien sounds a few species are known for? For a great many birds, sounds are innate and instinctual. The real exceptions are hummingbirds, of course parrots, and then perching birds, which includes all the songbirds in the world. For these birds, they must observe and practice to master their calls. This is why parrots can mimic the human voice. Birds that learn their song start by listening to adults in what is known as the sensory period, where they memorize the notes. This is then followed by intensive practice, where they develop a plastic song which is not all the way done, with parts of the song still being improved. Like human babies, young birds babble when trying to learn their songs, mastering each note or trill. This practice phase is known as the sensory motor period. Finally, the song becomes crystallized when they master it. In some birds, known as seasonal species, once a song becomes crystallized, that is it. It is, well, set in crystal. But other species are open-ended learners. They can repeat this cycle of sensory to sensory motor to the crystallized period over and over, letting their song change over time. This is most notable in species that are accomplished mimics, appropriating sounds from other species into an ever more complicated song. Passerines, the perching birds, which includes about half of avian diversity and some of the best vocal talent, can be broadly broken into two groups, oocynes and subocynes. The main distinction between the two groups is in the syrinx, which is where birds make their sounds, distinct from the vocal cords in mammals. The difference between these two groups of passerines is in muscular attachments to this remarkable organ, located where the trachea branches off to the lungs. The more specialized muscle attachments in oocynes give them the distinctive ability to have sound lateralization. That is, different muscles are attached to the two branches off the syrinx, meaning these birds can produce two different notes simultaneously. This helps give oocynes the ability to make more fluid and musical songs, along with making sounds that are just bizarre. Oocynes are very successful, found all over the world. Thus, despite their incredible anatomy, they are all the common songbirds you know. Thrushes, warblers, sparrows, and blackbirds. Subocynes, in contrast, are absent from many parts of the world. In Eurasia and Africa, they are pretty much restricted to the tropics in only a handful of families. In the Americas, they are far more diverse, with the tyrant flycatchers being a reasonably successful group of migrants to the temperate zones of North America. The neotropics, though, are the stronghold of these birds, with really high diversity of subocyne families. Mannequins, ant birds, ant thrushes, and kotzingas. Unlike oocyne songbirds, New World flycatchers know their songs instinctively. Being the most well-studied subocynes, this difference in learning methods is another commonly cited difference between these two groups of perching birds. Subocynes have their calls and songs innately. Oocynes must learn. However, some subocynes, like parrots, songbirds, and hummingbirds, show the ability to learn and change their song. Cotingas are one such family of subocynes that show this learning ability. The three-waddled bellbird is a strange cotinga of Central America. It belts out loud bonk calls that ring across the canopy of montane Costa Rican forests during its breeding season. Each year, this song, if it can be called that, changes slightly, shifting over the lifetime of a bellbird. This means they must not only learn the song of the species, they must learn subsequent shifts in the song each year. In these same montane forests, another subocyne seems to also have the ability to alter its complex mating songs and calls. Long-tailed mannequins have a very complex ritual involved in attracting a mate. First, it requires two males working together, an alpha and a beta. They must sing a duet of what is called the Toledo call to bring females to the area. 
Then, the two males move from the canopy where they sing to near the forest floor, where they do a dancing display. Then, it moves into a silent flight show. If all these steps are executed perfectly, the alpha will get to mate with the female. Young males spend most of their lives preparing for the few years they will get to be an alpha. The best way to describe it is it is like an apprenticeship. The beta is the main apprentice, waiting for his master to die and ascend to take control of the court, and to have the chance to pass on his genes to the next generation. Below the beta are gamma males. Young male mannequins have a unique delayed plumage maturation, not molting into adult male plumage until they reach their fifth year. These young males move from court to court, listening and practicing, what we might call networking. The more connections with different courts a male can make is correlated to his future mating success. The evidence that these birds are learning so far has only been that they are able to alter their song, changing their intercall frequency to avoid making overlapping Toledos with their known neighbors, or make them overlap unknown male pairs, ruining their Toledo calls. This plasticity shows they are able to change their song, and it is not completely driven by instinct. This was fun. I found a way to trick you into watching what you thought would just explain how birds make songs and learn them, but I found a way to prattle on about some obscure subosine families in the Neotropics. It was also fun to revisit the literature on long-tailed mannequins, which I did a study on when I visited Costa Rica, where I attempted to do a close and far study of intercall frequency in the Monteverde area. If you want to hear more about mannequins, I made a whole video on them. I also produced a video on how animals in the canopy make sure they are heard. I implore you to go check those out. On this channel, I strive to create quality miniature documentaries and educational videos on biology and conservation, and hope to inspire outdoor exploration and conservation action. Thank you for checking this video out, and until next time, bye.